Udan with a, a very the famous Lewontin. guy. Lewontin. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't dare to say it was this one. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, with Lewontin. Um, and then he worked on, on uh, evolution uh, of um, mutation and evolution and epistasis in particular. That's how I, I got to, to interact with him. Uh, but he does a lot of other things. And I think today is going to be on very different uh, subject. But he still works on, on epistasis, mutation, uh, resistance to antibiotics, um, and also on now on mutation scan. Uh, but today is going to be a very different thing. And he's right now in Montpellier. So you can actually meet him in real. And he's going to be there until late June, I think, right? Uh, I'm going to be here until late May. Uh, with luck, we'll be in France through the summer. But geographic distances are very distorted these days, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. But okay, yeah, well, we'll take advantage. Uh, contact uh, him directly or me to meet him. Bye. Please do. Please do. Thank you very much, Guillaume. And thank you to the organizers, Emmanuel, uh, Nacho, Luis, and others uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this morning. Uh, as Guillaume said, I'm a professor at Brown University in the US, and I'm here on sabbatical uh, for the spring semester. Um, this trip was meant to happen in the fall. Uh, it was then postponed for the obvious reasons. Um, but I want to thank Guillaume in particular for doing the legwork and getting the key document that allowed my wife and me to get long stay visas, which allowed us to breeze through customs in Paris at the end of December. Um, Many of our friends in the US said, why the hell are you going to France in the middle of a global pandemic? We feel just the opposite. You have to be somewhere. Why not the south of France? And uh, we've really been enjoying ourselves here. Uh, in the lower left, you can see the view out my apartment window right now. Uh, we've been visiting the nearby countryside. Thank you, Guillaume, for the loan of the bicycles, which we've put to good use almost every weekend. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Rémi Froissart, who invited me, as Guillaume mentioned, to Montpellier almost 15 years ago and unwittingly planted the seeds for this uh, long visit now. Uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to be able to share the results I'm going to share with you now, in part because I think they're really exciting and in part because I'm very interested in the possibility of developing some new experimental collaborations. So if some of the things that I talk about today resonate at all with questions you think about in the laboratory, uh, I'd be very, very happy to uh, explore the possibility of developing some formal collaborations. So before we get into the science, I want to acknowledge the, uh, my collaborators. Almost all the work I'm going to do was uh, performed by Eugene Raines, my postdoc, um, who's uh, extremely talented. Uh, he's both a good experimentalist and a good uh, a theoretician. And he's also on the job market. So if you hear of any uh, academic opportunities that might be of interest to him, please let me know. Scott Wiley was a postdoc a few years ago who was here, as they say, on the ground floor and made some key contributions to the, getting the theory off the ground. Uh, Paul Snagowski and Christina Birch are colleagues at other schools that have at different intervals made important contributions to our understanding. And uh, none of this would have been possible without the generous support of the US National Science Foundation, uh, which has paid Eugene's salary for the past four years. Okay, so uh, I have an outline. Here is my outline. There are four things I want to talk about. First, I want to review classical results uh, from theoretical population genetics which find that uh, the effect of population size on natural selection is only to uh, influence the efficiency of natural selection. But in fact, we are now aware of several cases of mutations that exhibit what we call sign inversion. These are mutations that break the rule. They are not only uh, affected in different efficiencies as population size changes, but indeed are affected in different directions by natural selection as population size changes. I'll review several published examples, starting with the one that we found, um, and then develop a synthetic understanding of the mechanism that pulls together all these examples, um, and then comment on uh, future directions. Okay, so what's the classical theory? A new mutation's fate is stochastic in, in, uh, in in theory, in a finite population, a beneficial mutation can appear and actually will almost always be lost by bad luck due to, uh, uh, due to the fact that the number of 
ultimately due to the fact that the number of offspring of every individual in the population has to be an integer. And so that drives realizations away from the deterministic expectations. So this is an expression that tells us the probability of fixation for a neutral mutation. It's equal to the reciprocal of the population size, or more generally, it's equal to its frequency. But we will primarily be interested in the probability of fixation of new mutations. In other words, mutations whose frequency is equal to the reciprocal of the population size. I should say, by the way, that um, for me, n, the population size is the number of chromosomes in the population. I generally think and work in haploid organisms. So it's, that's why it's one over n instead of the one over two n one often sees in textbooks. Here's what this probability of fixation looks like. And we're gonna see quite a few plots that are of this general form. The x-axis is the population size or the logarithm of the population size and the y-axis is the probability of fixation. Here for a neutral mutation, it's the reciprocal of the population size, which is a straight line on this doubly log transformed plot. This is a modest elaboration also from classical theory for the probability of fixation of a mutation that has the selection coefficient other than zero. Again, assuming that it starts at a single copy and uh, superimposing the form of that equation onto the previous plot, you can see that beneficial mutations have a probability of fixation that's better than the neutral benchmark and deleterious mutations have a probability of fixation that's worse than the neutral benchmark, as you would expect. Um, but importantly, selection is overwhelmed by drift when the population size is less than roughly the reciprocal of the, of the selection coefficients. You can see the blue and orange lines converge, the green and orange lines converge, and that reflects the fact that drift becomes a, a much stronger process as population size uh, gets small. In other words, selection becomes inefficient in small populations. Now, uh, we're gonna, throughout the talk, focus not on the probability of fixation, but on the normalized probability of fixation because the benchmark, neutral benchmark itself responds to population size. That is to say, as shown here, the probability of fixation of a neutral mutation is not independent of population size. And we want to control for that effect. So we're going to focus instead on the probability of fixation of a mutation normalized or divided by the probability of fixation of a neutral mutation in that same population size, because the probability of fixation of a neutral mutation is one over n, dividing by one over n is the same as multiplying by n. So you are gonna see a lot of plots today where the y-axis is not p-fix, but n-p-fix. And that will allow us to represent the neutral benchmark as a horizontal line. So this is the exact same uh, analysis as I showed you on the last slide, except now everything is rotated. So the neutral benchmark is everywhere one, but the same effect of drift or the same interaction between drift and selection is evident. And at small populations, when population size is roughly less than the reciprocal of the selection coefficient, the mutation tends to become, becomes ever more neutral with respect to its long-term fate, okay? Sign inversion is a class of mutations that we discovered, which break this rule. So here are two examples. One is from work of Martin Novak's on the evolution of cooperation. And this tit for tat cooperator has a probability of fixation that exceeds the neutral benchmark in small populations, but is less than the neutral benchmark in large populations. And the mutator story, which is where we began and will begin now, it has the opposite form. It's selected against in small populations before becoming beneficial. I should say that uh, we, were, uh, we were very excited by this was the, the, the formal nature of this result when we wrote the mutator paper and gave it the name sign inversion. When we went back to the literature, we realized there were several other papers that had described the phenomenon, but hadn't really uh, appreciated, I would say, hadn't really appreciated the evolutionary uh, novelty of this non-monotonic response to population size. Okay, so let's now look at the several published examples of mutations that exhibit this phenomenon called sign inversion. To begin with, I'm gonna tell you, uh, I'm gonna spend uh, a, a little bit of time talking about the evolution of mutation rate, both because that's where we entered the, the, the field, but also because it's the simplest model to understand. Uh, 
And the first thing one has to appreciate is that mutation rate in an organism can evolve. Mutation rate is determined by the particular allelic uh, 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 constitution of an organism at the loci that are responsible for DNA replication and repair. So you can imagine a mutation in a DNA replication or repair locus could affect the mutation rate. And this was first made crystal clear in early work uh, coming out of Rich Lenski's lab. So if you're not familiar with this experiment, Rich had the very clever idea over 30 years ago to start 12 uh, replicate populations of E. coli from an isogenic ancestor. So at the beginning of this experiment, at generation zero, every uh, cell in the fly, in every one of these flasks was genetically identical. And they're, they've been propagated faithfully every day by a hundredfold dilution. Uh, as of March of last year, they were at about 73,500 generations. They then put the whole experiment in the freezer on account of the, of the pandemic. A great deal has been learned from uh, this experiment. And I don't think Rich had a particularly clear focus, uh, focused question that motivated him at the outset, but it's really been a tremendous test platform for looking at fine scale properties of evolution by natural selection. And for our purposes, this result from Paul Snagowski, uh, uh, only a few years after, I'm sorry, that's a typo, it should say 1997, uh, but uh, less than 10 years after the experiment began, 10,000 generations in, Paul discovered that three of the 12 lineages, three of these 12 replicate populations had evolved the mutation rate that's roughly a hundredfold higher than the ancestors. So arrayed across the x-axis of these two plots are the 12 replicate lineages together with the ancestors. On the y-axis is the mutation rate that Paul measured. And what you can see is for three of the 12, there are two different mutation rate assays that Paul used, but for three of the 12 um, replicate lineages, the mutation rate is between uh, 10 and 100 times higher. Than, uh, than it had been. Why did this happen? This is the explanation that Paul developed and it's, it's, it's certainly true. It's important to appreciate that Rich's experiment was built with cells that were incapable of genetic recombination. They were intentionally uh, uh, started with a, a genotype that was rec A minus. It's not able to do genetic recombination. So all the evolution that's gone on in the system has been asexual. Now, this picture is meant to characterize the idea that a mutator can reach high frequency by genetic hitchhiking. The idea is that each horizontal line is a different genotype and time proceeds from top to bottom. So at the top line, the oldest line in this representation, a single genotype by chance discovers a mutation that increases its mutation rate. That's shown by the red dot. Now, by virtue of the fact that it has a higher mutation rate, this individual organism will be producing organisms that are genetically more different from it than typical organisms' offsprings are. And there's some probability that this individual will produce an offspring that has a beneficial mutation, shown by the green square. Because these cells are asexual, that beneficial mutation will thus be genetically linked to the mutation responsible for the higher mutation rate. And if the green beneficial mutation succeeds in spreading through the population, modulo the stochastic uh, uh, phenomenology I described for you uh, 10 minutes ago, then as it increases in frequency, it will carry with it this linked uh, mutator allele, which thus can spread through the population. And we're now uh, essentially 100% sure that that explains why the mutator spread through those three replicates of Rich's experiment. And in subsequent years, several other mutators have been discovered. So we became interested in the question of how the probability of the fixation of a mutator might respond to population size. And I'm gonna tell you the story the way we wrote it up in the paper, but I will admit, uh, which is to say, I'm gonna first show you some algebra, and then I'm gonna show you some computer simulations that validate the algebra, and I'm gonna show you a big experiment. In fact, as is often the case, the truth is a little bit messier. Eugene was playing around with some cells then trying to do some pilot experiments for the evolution of mutation rate. And he'd been doing his work in flasks when he was a graduate student. He wanted to do them in 96 well microtiter plates so he could get a little bit of economy of scale. And the mutator, which reliably evolved in the flasks, wasn't evolving in the plates. And we thought, well, maybe it's something about the abiological differences in the environment. And then we started to think carefully, and this is really Scott's pivotal contribution, Scott Wiley's critical problem contribution that maybe population size matters. Okay, 
The way the story is told today is that we assume that in asexuals, mutators can fix by one of two processes. They can hitchhike with a beneficial mutation that then fixes. That's the picture I just showed you. And here's a schematic of the math behind that. X-axis is the log of the population size. Y-axis is this um, uh, NP fix quantity, the neutral benchmark as before. Imagine that the beneficial mutation that the mutator creates has a fitness advantage of 10%, then except for the fact that it was produced by a mutator, the, its probability of fixation is shown by the blue line. Well, the difference is that the mutator need not produce a beneficial mutation. Most mutations are deleterious. So most mutations that mutators make are deleterious. So the probability of fixation as a function of population size conditioned on the appearance of a beneficial mutation has to be downweighted by the probability of that event. That's the conceptual idea that we had. And so here's the algebra a little bit more formally. The probability of fixation by hitchhiking is given by the classical quantity on the right, but normalized by the probability of a beneficial mutation. At the same time, mutators can fix by drift in spite of the fact that selection generally acts against them. Again, most mutations are deleterious, which means most mutators will be selected against. But that doesn't mean that they won't fix, just as beneficial mutations have a non, uh, have a probability of fixation less than one, deleterious mutations have a probability of fixation greater than zero. And this is a result from, uh, uh, from the good old days, uh, a classical result that tells us that the selection that takes advantage of the fact that the selection coefficient acting against the mutator as, as a consequence of this recurrent deleterious mutational load that it's producing is given by the difference in mutation rates. So this is the classical probability of fixation and the selection coefficient is, it's a negative selection coefficient and its magnitude is given by the difference between the mutation rate of the mutator and the mutation rate of the wild type. Interestingly, it's independent of the distribution of fitness effects among these deleterious mutations. And that's a result that goes back to Haldane. Uh, it's quite a lovely result. Okay, so here's what that looks like uh, in, in graphical form. Again, x-axis is the population size, y-axis is NP fix. The probability of fixing by drift in very small populations is equal to the neutral benchmark. But as population size goes up, selection against this deleterious load that the mutator primarily is producing becomes more efficient and the normalized probability of fixation collapses. In total then, the mutator can fix by, with probability given by the sum of these two probabilities. Mutators fix by drift or by hitchhiking. At the end of the day, they fixed. So the probability is simply the sum of these two probabilities written this way. And here's what that looks like. So I've simply taken the green and the red curves and added them together to get the blue. And here then are some computer simulations to validate our thinking. The algebra assumes that once a mutation occurs, no subsequent, once a selected mutation occurs, no subsequent mutations occur, which means the algebra disregards clonal interference. The reason why the simulations fall below the analytic expectation at very large population sizes is that there are multiple competing beneficial mutations in the simulations. And that when there are multiple competing uh, mutations, the classical prediction for the probability of fixation overestimates the truth. Okay. Finally, Eugene went to the laboratory and did a Herculean experiment using the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. He had, a, he had constructs that were genetically identical, except one had a 20-fold higher mutation rate than the other. And then he did hundreds of replicate populations exactly the way Linsky did, except in microtiter plates, and managed the population size by managing the depth of his daily serial dilutions. So here are the results when the dilutions were shallow, which means the population was size was large. He did almost 250 generations. He was able to track the frequency of the mutator by virtue of having also labeled these cells with fluorescent markers. And so he could count the cells efficiently on a fax machine. What you see, each blue line is the individual replicate and the red dots are the averages across replicates. You can see the frequency of the mutator drops early because it's mostly producing deleterious mutations, but then it succeeds in reaching fixation in the vast majority of replicates and across replicates, the average frequency of the mutator goes from 50% to 80%. As I told you at the outset, the probability of fixation for a neutral mutation in general is its starting frequency. 
So if the mutator were neutral, we would expect its ending frequency to be 50%. This 80% or so endpoint is a huge difference and very highly significant because of all the replicates that Eugene did. Here's the same experiment when the daily dilutions are very deep, which means the effective population size was small. The mutator goes down in frequency and never recovers. Okay, so sign inversion and mutators. Once we had the idea that this might be a phenomenon for mutators long before we actually finished the, the paper, we uh, began to look into the literature and discovered this example from Christina Birch's group of a couple years earlier. They were studying the evolution of a modifier that allows sexual recombination. These are really important and complicated questions, the evolution of sex, which are very difficult to uh, experimentally manage. And so Christina is using a um, uh, population of gene regulatory networks, which is a simulation platform that was first brought to evolutionary biologists by Andreas Wagner and uh, others, including Mark Siegel, have made a lot of progress here. Christina here is doing the same experiment that we were imagining. There's a homogeneous population of asexual gene regulatory networks. She injects a single sexual gene regulatory network. She does that thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of times and counts the fraction of replicates in which the sexual gene regulatory network lineage takes over the population and finds this same non-monotonic response to population size, sign inversion. Why is this happening? To understand, we have to go under the hood of what happens in sexual and asexual populations. So the first thing to appreciate is that sexual organisms suffer a fitness burden as a consequence of recombination. Recombination will disrupt favorable pairs of alleles or favorable groups of alleles across the genome. That's called the recombinational load. And what Christina's student, Alex Whitlock, did here was to follow the recombinational load in homogeneous sexual and homogeneous asexual populations before there's any competition, just to see what happens. Now, asexual uh, organisms don't suffer any recombinational load, so those black dots are at zero ac across the entire time scale of the experiment. But the asexuals, you'll see, have a transient increase in recombinational load, but then evolve recombinational robustness, and in other words, the recombinational load goes down. Recombinational load is defined as the difference in fitness between parents and offspring mediated by recombination. Very interestingly, and I don't know whether this had been described before, Christina's group observed a correlated response in the deleterious mutation rate. In other words, the evolution of mutational robustness gives a correlated evolution of mutational robustness. Let me make sure I said that right. The evolution of recombinational robustness gives a correlated response in mutational robustness. So you can see that in the second, in the, in, the, in the middle row here, in the top, that's now the top row here, both the sexual and asexual lineages evolve lower deleterious mutation rates. They evolve to places on the fitness landscape where mutations hurt less. But because the sexual organisms are also being driven to parts of the landscape where recombination hurts less, it turns out that there's a extra reduction in the deleterious mutation rate and this in turn gives rise to an increase, an extra increase in equilibrium mean fitness. It turns out essentially using that same result of Haldane's that the fitness of an organism can be described simply as a function of its deleterious mutation rate. And because the deleterious mutation rate in sexual lineages is lower, the fitness is higher. So sexual lineages that are invading an asexual population will transiently suffer a fitness deficit due to recombinational load, but if they survive, they will involve increased mutational robustness and thus higher mean fitness and, uh, and can displace the, sexual, the asexual resident. And that's what's shown here. So this is an average over a bunch of populations, a bunch of replicates. The red line is the fitness of the sexual invader. It begins by dropping below the resident mean fitness shown by the horizontal dashed line before eventually increasing because of this L additional reduction in deleterious mutation rate resulting in an increase in mean fitness. Third example is this tit for tat cooperator that you've already seen. Tit for tat is a, is a, a game theoretic strategy that represents cooperation. 
And uh, individuals that adopt the tit for tat strategy have, fought, have high fitness if they interact with other tit for tat individuals, but low fitness if they interact with cheaters called always the fact. And so uh, Martin Novak described this effect. And here's how it works. So this mutation, this tit for tat mutation experiences positive frequency dependent selection. It's deleterious at low frequency because it's mostly interacting with other, with, with cheaters, with always defects, and that's being taken advantage of. But as its frequency goes up, assuming the population is well mixed, it will begin to interact often enough with other cooperators that they together will enjoy the advantage of being cooperators and thus become beneficial. And so for the tit for tat co uh, cooperator to invade, it has to negotiate this gap between zero and the critical frequency where it becomes beneficial, which we call F. It must rise to F, even though it's deleterious at those frequencies, it must rise to F by drift while rare. And then if it's successful in that, it will almost surely fix because it'll become beneficial. So one way of thinking about, let's see if I can, oops, let's see if I can find my pointer. Is that the pointer? One way of thinking about this, where the tit for tat cooperator has a higher than neutral probability of fixation, is that we're only asking the tit for tat cooperator to drift from zero to F, whereas the benchmark is being asked to drift from zero to one. Now, there's selection acting against the tit for tat cooperator in that interval between zero and F. But if population size is small, that reduction in probability of fixation, because the total transit distance is less, can be more than offset. That's what's going on here. Okay. We now turn to the synthetic part of the talk. We were fascinated by these three models. We thought they seem, they seem in many respects different from each other. They also tickled our fancy because they are each models of evolution that are outside of the kind of common domain where we'd been working. We, you know, as, as, as Guillaume mentioned, I've worked on epistasis, I work in drug resistance. These mutations that I think about have an unconditionally beneficial or deleterious effect. Whereas what I've just described, each of these mutations has a rather bizarre pattern of influence on fitness. And what we realized, this is recent work of Eugene, so I'll give him credit. What Eugene realized is that each of these mutations have the property that they're beneficial in some carriers and deleterious in others. So let's review. Mutators are deleterious to, because they can be genetically linked to deleterious mutations, but they're beneficial in those individuals in which they're linked to beneficial mutations. The recombiner is deleterious because it suffers a deleterious recombinational load, but if it can survive long enough, it becomes beneficial because it, come, it then imparts a reduction in the deleterious mutation rate. And the tit for tat cooperator is costly when it's rare because it's competing primarily with cheaters, but becomes beneficial if the frequency becomes high enough that it interacts primarily with other cooperators. When we thought about this a little bit more carefully, we realized immediately that we could partition these models into two classes. The mutator has the property that a particular lineage of mutators is either beneficial or deleterious. This is a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of, an, of an approximation, but the mutator is introduced in the population and we imagine it almost immediately produces a, a fitness affecting mutation, either beneficial or deleterious. And we also, for the moment, assume that there are no further fitness affecting mutations. So what that means is that this lineage, this particular lineage of mutators is either beneficial or deleterious. And so in this picture here, you can see as time moves from left to right, the three arrows at the top indicate independent appearances of this between lineage fitness variable mutation, e.g. mutator. And two of the lineages are deleterious and one of them is beneficial. And the deleterious lineages in the deleterious lineages, the mutation remains deleterious for the life of the lineage. And in the beneficial lineage, the lineage, the, the effect of the mutation is to be beneficial for the life of the lineage. In contrast, both the recombiner and the tit for tat mutations have the property that their effects change over time. And the same lineage, individuals in the same lineage will sometimes experience a fitness cost and other times experience a fitness advantage. In the case of the recombiner, the change is mediated explicitly by time. If they can hang on long enough that the deleterious mutation rate drops below that of the um, asexual resident. 
In the case of the tit for tat, it drops over time, but as a function of changing frequency. So we subdivided these three cases into, those, into three simple models. One that exhibits between lineage sign variability, one that exhibits within lineage sign variability mediated by time, and one that exhibits within lineage sign variability mediated by frequency. And simulated simplified abstracted versions of each of these models to learn more. So model one is this between lineage variance model. Every time this mutation is introduced with probability P Ben, the mutant lineage, the mutant and all of its offspring enjoy a fitness advantage S Ben. And with probability one minus P Ben, they suffer a fitness cost S cost. Here are simulation results from that model. Here is the probability of drifting to fixation. That is to say the probability of drifting even though in the case of one minus P Ben of individuals that suffer the cost. Here is the probability uh, classically of fixation of a mutation with benefit S Ben, which we again have to downweight by the probability P Ben. So this should be very familiar to you because it, it really reads almost exactly the same as did the mutator story I told you before, except that we've replaced uh, the probability of a beneficial mutation in the context of this mutator model with this abstracted idea of something good happening to this lineage. And as a consequence of P-Ben, selection for this allele remains, uh, selection for this allele remains overwhelmed by drift at population sizes much larger than you would have expected. So let's see if I can find my cursor again. Um, maybe I've, uh, here we go. So here is where selection would be overwhelmed by, uh, where as population size gets small, selection becomes overwhelmed by drift here. But in this case, selection doesn't start to influence, positive selection doesn't start to influence the fate of this allele until way out here. The time dependent fitness model is very similar. All mutants suffer a fitness cost S cost for the first T generations after which they all enjoy a fitness benefit S Ben. Here are the simulation results and here is the fitness function. As time goes along, we, we decided for the first 50 generations, this allele would have a 10% fitness cost after which it would have a 10% fitness advantage. Here is the probability of fixation normalized by the neutral benchmark over, I think it's 10 million replicates per population size. Here is the probability of fixing in the first 50 generations, i.e. while this thing is still deleterious. There's probably an analytic result that we could have used for this purpose. It's probably buried somewhere in Kimura's work, but I don't, couldn't find it. So we just picked these numbers out of our simulations. Here again is the probability fixation. If it weren't for this 50 generation lag before becoming beneficial, here is the key quantity. This is different than in the between lineage uh, uh, model. These alleles, these lineages have to survive for 50 generations in the face of purifying selection. Again, there's probably an analytic result for this, but I don't know it. So we picked these values out of the simulations, population size on the x-axis, the probability of surviving one or more lineages surviving to 50 generations plotted on the y-axis. And now we just multiply the classical probability of fixation by these probabilities of survival to recover exactly the NP fix for the time dependent model. And again, as a consequence of P survive being very small, you can see it's on the order of 10 to the negative second to negative third for these parameter values. Selection remains in favor of this allele remains overwhelmed at population sizes much larger than you would have expected classically. And finally, the frequency dependent fitness case, all mutants suffer a fitness cost S cost while below frequency F after which they all enjoy a fitness benefit S Ben. Here are the results. And, uh, and in the inset, you can see the fitness function. And now the x-axis is not time, but frequency. This model is a little bit different because they're, and unlike the past two models where uh, the mutant can fix by drift, even though it's costly, in this model, the mutant has to transit across the entirety of the frequency spectrum. So every lineage that succeeds has to survive to a high enough frequency to enjoy the benefit. So the algebra turns out to be a little bit different, but here's the normalized probability of getting from frequency one over N to F. 
And you can see it drops with n, and that's because selection is acting against the allele over that frequency range. Here's the probability of getting from f to 1 normalized by the appropriate neutral benchmark. I'm not going to take time to explain why the leading coefficients here aren't n. It's got to do with the uh, expectations for a neutral mutation, getting from one over n to some arbitrary frequency f, and the probability of a neutral mutation getting from arbitrary frequency f up to one. Take my word for it, this math is right. And what you can see is the probability of fixation um, conditioned on getting to the frequency is higher than one, but the probability of getting to the frequency is crashing as n goes up. Here we've shown the probability un unnormalized. This is simply the probability of getting from one over n to f as a function of population size. And you can see it crashes with n as you would expect intuitively. Also, as you probably would expect intuitively, it's falling much faster than n. That's important. When we multiply the probability of reaching fixation, uh, a probability of reaching fixation from one over f at each population size by the probability of reaching f, we get, we re again, recover the simulation results. So we feel very good. We feel that we understand the parts that are in common in all three models and the parts that differ between all three models. Let me review what they are. Again, as a consequence of, N, of, of this new term, the probability of getting, from, in this case, getting from one over N to F, selection for the allele becomes, now it's a little bit different. Selection for the allele becomes overwhelmed eventually. This quantity is dropping so fast that even though this probability is continuing to go up, albeit slowly, the product of the two eventually drops below one. So in each case, the probability of fixation relative to classical expectations is reduced by the probability of being beneficial. Here's a cartoon of what I've told you repeatedly. Again, x-axis is population size, y-axis is the normalized probability of fixation, the neutral benchmark is the horizontal dashed line, the red curve is the classical result if the effect is unconditionally beneficial. In the between lineage case, the probability that it is beneficial is independent of n. And so we simply multiply the classical result by some constant to get this example of sign inversion. And because the probability of being beneficial is independent of n, the net effect of uh, this multiplication is that the NP fix for the mutation of interest has this concave up shape. In the case of a positive time dependent model, the probability of survival quickly becomes roughly independent of n. So we again can roughly multiply by a constant and again recover a concave up response to population size in this quantity NP fixed. The positive frequency dependent case is a little bit different because the probability of the effect being beneficial collapses so quickly with n when we multiply the, that probability by the classical result, if the effect simply were beneficial, we get this concave down response. Okay, that's all I wanted to say uh, in terms of new work. The last little bit is simply uh, speculation and future directions. The first point I wanna make is that Eugene's insight that all cases of sign inversion are for mutations that exhibit this sign variable fitness effect. So sign variable fitness effects that a mutation is beneficial for some carriers and deleterious for others is necessary for sign inversion. It's not sufficient. You can cook the parameter values in such a way that even though the mutation is sometimes beneficial and sometimes deleterious, you still don't see sign inversion. But this idea that a mutation could have different effects, different fitness effects in different carriers is one that was already in the air in my group. My former grad student, Chris Graves, wrote this nice paper in uh, the annual review a few years ago in which he explored the consequences for natural selection in general of variability and fitness effects. So he's not focusing only on mutations that are sometimes beneficial and other times deleterious, but rather more generally, mutations whose fitness effect varies. And his point was that, that essentially as ours is in this work, that the classical expectations for the probability of fixation uh, go out the window and uh, 
Chris really felt like the, the, the punchline was that the idea that we were selecting for the fittest goes out the window. He's not the first one to say that. And, and, and the, these, these ideas seem to be sort of in the vicinity of all of the studies of all these kinds of mutations that don't simply have a, a, an effect of increasing resistance against ampicillin by uh, uh, you know, two log orders. In other words, mutations that don't have an unconditionally beneficial or deleterious effect. So we put this table in the paper to sort of point the way to sources of variability across lineages. So there's biology in the, in the specific examples, spatial variation, temporal variation in environment, uh, kin selection, multi-level selection, and these genetic factors. And Chris's point was we can partition these various sources of lineage variable fitness effects into those that are driven by environmental change, those that are driven by social change, and those that are driven by genetic change. And then we put a few examples of mutations, bet hedgers, cooperators, et cetera. I just want to point out that I've just shown you sign inversion operates on three of these kinds of mutations. More generally, I think there's a whole domain of mutations whose effects on their carriers is not constant that are likely going to be involved in these very interesting non-classical population genetic effects. Indeed, this table motivated my group to proceed a little bit further down the road. And these are results of Eugene's from um, uh, uh, simulation results for the evolution of ploidy. So as always, population size on the x-axis, normalized probability fixation on the y-axis. This is a diploid trying to invade. And you can see that it's favored at small populations, but it, depending on the dominance coefficient becomes deleterious at larger population sizes. And this, uh, the last thing I'm going to share with you is work from my uh, from a younger grad student in my group working on the evolution of bet hedging. So bet hedging, you saw a couple of slides ago on the slide from Chris's on the in the table from Chris's paper. Bet hedging is an evolutionary strategy to deal with varying environments. If the environment is inv is, is invariant, then there's going to likely be one strategy that's optimal. But if the individual, if an organism doesn't know what environment it's going to find itself in, or what environment its offspring are going to find themselves in, it sometimes pays to hedge your bet and produce offspring that uh, that have uh, that draw their uh, their behavior from a distribution of possibilities in the hopes that one of those offspring will be really well uh, uh, attuned to the environment that happens to appear. Classically. Uh, this line of reasoning has led to the idea that natural selection will favor strategies that maximize the geometric mean fitness across strategies. It's a geometric mean because replication is multiplicative, not additive. So we multiply the succession of fitnesses that a lineage enjoys over time, and the average is weighted by the probabilities that each particular environment is encountered. So classically, we believe that if the geometric mean fitness of a bet hedger is higher, and the geometric mean fitness of the resident specialist, the bet hedger will invade. What Maya has shown is that's true, but in a stochastic framework, even bet hedgers whose geometric mean fitness is less than the wild type, uh, the wild type's geometric mean fitness, the bet hedger can invade, but it exhibits sign inversion. So only in sufficiently large populations will these bet hedgers with lower geometric mean fitness invade. And the geometric mean fitness of the bet hedger can't be arbitrarily low, but there's a zone outside of the zone in parameter space previously recognized. And uh, Luis, this is what I was thinking about during your talk in January. It seems to have to do with interactions between stochasticity and the environment, which is largely averaged away in the GMF treatment. But the stochastic succession of environments that a lineage experiences, coupled with the stochastic successes and failures of reproduction, seem to be what's driving this effect, but we really don't understand it yet. Okay, that's all I have to say. I think the time is good. Uh, I've told you about classical expectations for probability of fixation. I've introduced you to the idea of sign inversion that breaks that classical expectation. I walked you through three examples and kind of opened up the hood to see how they all worked. And then I offered you three much abstracted and simplified models that seem to capture the spirit of these three published cases, which allowed us to understand that the essential features of sign inversion are sign variability and the particular sensitivity to the probability that, a muta that the mutation will be beneficial in its carrier.
Uh, and then I talked about some future directions in my group. And as I said at the outset, I'm very interested in the possibility of future directions of working with some of you, if any of you have experimental systems or theoretical ideas that maybe articulate with some of this. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, uh, thanks Dan. So uh, we already do have a few questions. Um, I, I, so people can keep asking their question. That's the first thing I, I, I will say in the tab. Then uh, they can also vote for questions which helps us choose choosing. But for now, I'll just uh, think we just start by the pe person coming from the farthest. So, oh, okay. So it will be uh, Ariane de Visser uh, who had a question. So can uh, Emmanuel, can you turn his mic on? Please, because I can't, don't remember how to do that. So you should be able to activate yeah. your microphone. You hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering whether so the the, the population size dependence of the in the mutator case, yes, where mutators get selected against in small and selected for in large populations. That must yes. be sensitive to the relative rates of deleterious and beneficial mutations, I guess. Absolutely. And yeah. does it also, but how much does it depend on the relative rate and how much on the absolute rates of both classes? Uh, I was trying it to understand it. it. Yeah, well, it, it's very sensitive to the relative rates. Uh, the probability of a benefit, uh, the probability that a mutator produces a beneficial mutation is the beneficial mutation rate divided by the total mutation rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made the simplifying assumption that the beneficial mutation rate is vastly less than the deleterious mutation rate, which allowed us to approximate that as the ratio of beneficial to deleterious mutations. And uh, in our simulations, we set that value at 1%. Um, Eugene is now engaged in some experiments to try to measure that from those 300 populations at large and small population size. The rate at which the frequency of the mutator declines at the outset speaks directly to that question. And so Eugene's working on some follow-up experiments to answer that question. Um, the sensitivity, the so are you okay with that answer? Yeah, I guess that's, 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 a, clear, uh, uh, that's a clear answer for me. Yeah, thanks. What, what's interesting to me is that the strength of the mutator, how much higher, so we assume that the ratio of beneficial to deleterious mutations is unaffected by the mutator itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the strength of the mutator, is it a 20 fold or a hundred fold or a thousand fold mutator? That doesn't enter into our algebra at all. And, um, and I don't fully, uh, we explored that, which is of course to say Eugene mm -hmm. explored that in a supplemental to the last paper in this area. Uh, but I don't have a deep intuitive understanding for, for how that quantity enters into any of what I've just told you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for the next one, I think we can, can have a sort of debate or s something like that. So uh, uh, prepare for the challenge of having Thomas Le Normand and François Rousset who are both commenting on some aspects. So I guess the both of them can sort of uh, explain what they meant. Um, yo, hi, hi then, uh, Thomas. So um, perhaps I can, uh, I can let Francois ask this question. Really, he really worked on, on this a lot and he is <laughs> he's probably uh, the first person to ask about it. But the main point was that it looks like it's very familiar, this uh, issue of population size to, to uh, to models where you got frequency, positive frequency dependent selection, like in many uh, social evolution models. So that was the point. But I'm sure Francois can, can make the point in more detail if you want. Uh, perhaps I can instead ask uh, another more open question. Uh, it was, uh, I was curious about the, the diploidy models at the end. Yes. I was wondering uh, which case was it uh, exactly? Was it uh, just a time dependence type of situation whereby uh, uh, um, deploy to accumulate some uh, some load. I don't know. No, it's it's actually almost exactly the same as the mutator case. Diploids. If if the mutator. So this is a model where all mutations are deleterious, and so full dominance reduces the mutation rate of 
the dip of the, the, the diploid relative to the haploid. Um, right. right. It, so so it's it's exactly analogous to uh, to the first model that I talked about. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right. So then there was this comment about um, uh, Francois. Do you want to? Yes, please. Elaborate on this. Yes. So well, uh, first there was a comment that yes, this this is known from diffusion models. This sign inversion for uh, for uh, diffusion model with frequency dependence. But a more general question is uh, uh, there is no question that this process can occur. But then what what is the kind of uh, synthetic result that we can obtain considering that there are mutants with uh, different uh, penetrants and strengths of effects and so on. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm ignorant of the, um, the social evolution models that, that you're describing. So my, my request is, could you please send me a short reading list or a long reading list um, to get me started in that literature? It sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm sure it would be very interesting to, to me and my students. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't quite understand the question about uh, uh, underdominance. Could you, or overdominance or, or dominance in general? Could you ask, uh, ask that again for me, please? Oh, yes. So. Um... Uh, if if uh, heterozygotes uh, are uh, deleterious, but uh, uh, yes. uh, so homozygotes are favored. Yes. Uh, when the mutant is rare, it is uh, selected against, and when it is common, it is favored. So it's exactly what you are describing. And so yes. Uh, so there are diffusion formula for probability of fixation of mutants in that case. And, the, the tit for tat uh, case is uh, exactly analogous to that. Yeah, yeah. And so, th I mean, the figures I showed for tit for tat, I just lifted the algebra from Martin's paper of 2004. Um, and I don't mean to pretend that, that, there, that this wasn't known uh, in his literature or in the literature that you're more familiar with than I, but only to make the point that, so far as I can tell, the kind of evolutionary implications uh, and in particular, the sort of theoretical idea that this is such a radical deviation from the classical expectations, uh, so far as I know, is 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 our main contribution. But yes, right. I, I think I, I think I think right. the underdominance case is fascinating. We, the, thank you for that suggestion. I'd love to read the, some of that literature. So then we have a we have a question by uh, by Anne Florence. So it's, that's why you don't have to completely trust the. Question and answer Hi. that because there are people on their fake ID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Luis. Um, right, I mean, I think it's just because Guillaume sent me the link and somehow now I'm labeled as Guillaume. But yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dan, for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, you showed us very striking cases where NP fix can be larger or smaller than one depending on the value of N. Um, I was wondering if you encountered many more situations where NP fix is simply non monotonic but still remains below or above one? Oh. Uh, no. Uh, uh, you know, uh, my reaction is, but if I just continue to increase N, if it's turned, if it, let's consider a deleterious mutation, starting from small N, it drops, N P fix drops below one, yeah. Now it's non-monotonic, so it's increasing, but hasn't yet gotten up to one. Mm -hmm. I, I would ask you, why don't we just continue to increase the population size? Won't it eventually cross one? I see. Okay. So no, no cases where you have, for instance, a maximum and then it, it decays towards one, for instance? Oh, maybe asymptotically. So the, the, the answer is no. I have not okay. uh, I've not I've not observed anything of that sort and 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 my my intuition is uh, it's bad enough to have, uh, it, it, it's enough of a complexity to have a change of sign of the first derivative, to have it happen twice. I uh, see this. Is, is just a very abstractly, that seems, that's, that's a lot of biology. 
<laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Tom. Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, Luis, on, uh, we didn't hear you. Okay, Florian, can, you can ask your question, I think, now. Hi, Dan, thank you for, for your interesting talk. Um, I, I'm not sure I, that I've understood at a point, but um, maybe you, you explain that um, about the evolutionary outcomes that you've shown us. How does it depend on the balance between the deleterious and advantageous effects? So you, you have at a point the, this example where the, the, the deleterious effect is love point nine at first, and then it's 1.1. So uh, how does it depend on this balance? in your models? Only qualitatively. So uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, it, it depends, but only qualitatively. If, if the, and I'm gonna just make an assertion, but I'm rather confident that if the, it, so that was for the time dependent selection model. And if it starts deleterious uh, and then becomes beneficial, I can't see how there couldn't be sign inversion. But it's a matter of making the simulations run in a realistic, practical amount of time. Um, incidentally, and, and similarly for the frequency dependent model, you may have noticed there's an asymmetry. Selection against the cooperator was only 1% below the critical frequency and then jumped to 10%. And, and the reason is very simple. It, if the selection against, and we also made the critical frequency rather small, if selection against the cooperator is stronger, it gets killed in so many replicates uh, that it just becomes a, a, a pain to, to finish the simulations. Um, I will say that uh, non-mutators invading mutator populations also exhibit sign inversion. It's concave down. So I didn't show you that. I showed you mutators invading non-mutators. It's concave up. Non-mutators invading mutators also exhibit sign inversion. They're favored at small populations and become disfavored at large populations. Uh, similarly, negative time dependent and negative frequency dependent selection models also show uh, sign inversion. Uh, it, just, it just becomes more of a, 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 you know, a, a menagerie of models uh, to go into those details, but it, it's not, it doesn't matter whether S is positive first and negative later or vice versa. Okay, um, there are no more, no more questions on the list, but I would have one myself, I guess. Um, uh, several of these um, relationships between fixation probability and population size look similar, right? And you did, and I mean, from your title, I would have felt perhaps, or you haven't, but there could also be a, uh, a density dependent effect on selection, like RNK selection and things like this. So I'm wondering, uh, have you been thinking about how, uh, what's the minimum no, uh, amount of information that's needed to distinguish these things? You cannot distinguish lots of them uh, just based on this fixation probabilities versus N because uh, several are concave up and look the same basically. So you need some further information. Uh, in terms of inf inf inference, have you been thinking a bit about this? No, <laughs> uh, I haven't. Uh, I hadn't. I hadn't even contemplated the possibility of a question there. Your question is: If I go to nature and observe sign inversion and it's concave up, what else do I need to do to figure out the mechanism? What other measurements do I need to make? Something like this, yeah. yeah not not even fact. in nature, perhaps in your experiment, but you don't yeah. know what's causing it. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Uh, I also think, and this kind of comes back to some of what uh, we talked about earlier, um, I would be surprised if density dependence, density dependent models, I'm thinking I, I won't also somehow lead us to sign inversion. I'm thinking about a simple logistic model where uh, you know the model pushes counts down above carrying capacity and pushes counts up low carrying capacity. And I mean, that's not a, the, what I've said so far isn't the model of evolution. There's only one genotype, but I suspect 
it wouldn't take more than an hour's playing to figure out a way to build, you maybe already can see how to build a model uh, where you build in that kind of ecological framework and again, see these kinds of results. All right, so yeah, perhaps we, we should stop here because we're running out of time. Um, so thanks again for, for the talk and uh, for the discussions. Uh, so I just remind everyone that, that Dan is here until end of yes. May and perhaps in the summer too, you said? Well, we're, we're hoping to, uh, to go someplace else in, in the countryside and have more of a, of a vacation, but uh, yeah. you know what it's like we tend to always be working in some sense. So, uh, so yes, but please, um, you can find my email if you go to the Brown University website, or you can write an email to Guillaume, um, who will forward it to me or to Louis, Louise or any, any of the other folks um, in the organizing committee. I would love to hear from anybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, and so next week uh, we are um, having a seminar again at the, regu at the regular time with Alejandro Cusse. So. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much.